with chapter nine. Uh, chapter nine is a long chapter, so we've got several readers. Uh, it will start with Veronika Takarova, the preceptor uh, in Slavic languages and literature at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and then we'll have a, a, a two-person team from Indiana. It will be Craig and Rebecca Cravens. Craig is a senior lecturer uh, in the Slavic department, and Rebecca is a, an instructor of Russian language. Uh, then continuing on into the second half of chapter nine, we'll have Dustin Stalnaker, who is a New York-based uh, historian and who created uh, the website Tales from Yaroslav, which uh, features new translations of stories by our hero uh, Yaroslav Hasek. Uh, then on to Krista Pospichel, who is uh, a friend of the TG Maastricht Czech School in Cicero, Illinois. Uh, and then uh, rounding out chapter nine, Abigail Weil, the lecturer in Czech at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And so with that, I will oh, move to my illustration and turn it over to Veronica. Schweik in the garrison jail. For people who did not want to go to the front, the last refuge was the garrison jail. I once knew a probationer teacher who was a mathematician and did not want to serve in the artillery and shoot people. So he stole a lieutenant's watch to get himself into the garrison jail. He did this deliberately. War neither impressed nor enchanted him. Shooting at the enemy and killing with shrapnel and shells, equally unhappy probationer teachers of mathematics serving on the other side, seemed to him sheer idiocy. I don't want to be hated for my brutality, he said to himself and calmly stole the watch. First, they examined his mental condition but when he said he wanted to get rich quick, they sent him off to the garrison jail. There were a lot more people like that sitting there for theft or fraud, idealists and non-idealists. There were people who saw the war as the way of increasing their income. Those various quartermaster sergeants at the base or at the front who were up to all possible kinds of fiddles with methane and pay and also petty thieves who were a thousand times more honest than the black guards who sent them there. And soldiers sat there who had committed various other offenses of purely military kind, such as insubordination, attempted mutiny, or desertion. Then came the political prisoners who were in a special class. 80% of them were utterly innocent, and of these, 99% were sentenced. The whole establishment of the office of the judge advocate was magnificent. Every state on the brink of total political, economic, and moral collapse has an establishment like this. The aura of past power and glory clings to its courts, police, gendarmerie, and venal pack of informers. In every military unit, Austria had her snoopers who spied on their comrades, sleeping on the same bunks with them and sharing their bread on the march. In addition, the garrison jail was supplied with material by the state security, Messrs. Klima, Slavicek, and company. The military censorship consigned here the writers of letters exchanged between the men at the front and the despairing ones they had left behind at home. The gendarme even brought here poor old peasant pensioners who had written letters to the front and the court martial chucked them for 12 years as a punishment for their words of consolation and their descriptions of the misery at home. From the Hrachani garrison, the road led through Brzevnov to the grill ground at Motol. Along it, a procession would pass, headed by a man under military escort with his hands manacled and followed by a cart with a coffin on it. On the drill ground was heard the curt order, fire. And then in all the regiments and battalions, they read out the regimental order 
that one more man had been shot for mutiny during call-up when his wife, not bearing to be parted from him, had been slashed by the captain's saber. And in the garrison jail, the triumvirate, Staff Warder Slavik, Captain Linhart, and Sergeant Major Repa, alias the hangman, were getting on with the job. How many did they flock in solitary confinement? Perhaps in the Republic today, Captain Linhart is still a captain. I hope for his sake, his years of service in the garrison jail will count towards his pension. They do in the case of Slavicek and Klima from the state security. Zepa has returned to civilian life and carries on his profession as a master builder. Perhaps he's a member of one of the patriotic societies in the Republic. Under the Republic, Stop Warder Slavik became a thief and is today in jail. The poor man could not set himself up so comfortably in the Republic as the other military gentlemen did. It was quite natural that when he took charge of Schweik, Staff Warder Slavik gave him a look of mute reproach as much as to say, so you have got a tarnished reputation too if you've got yourself here. Well, love, we'll sweeten your stay here as we do for anyone who has fallen into our hands. And you know that our hands aren't exactly the ladies' kind. And to add weight to his look, he thrust his muscular fat fist under Shake's nose and said, Sniff that, you bastard. Schneef sniffed it and observed. I wouldn't like to get that in the nose. It smells of graveyard. This calm considered remark appealed to the staff warder. Hey, he said, prodding Shrek in the stomach with his fist. Stand straight. What's that you have got in your pockets? If it's cigarettes, you can leave them here. And hand over your money too, so that they don't steal it off you. Haven't you got anything else? Honest to God, don't tell lies now. You'll be punished for lying. Where shall we put him? Asked Sergeant Major Repa. In number 16, the stove warder decided, among the pens. Don't you see that Captain Linhart has marked his papers? Guard and watch closely. Oh, yes, indeed, he declared solemnly to Schweik. Vermin are treated like vermin. If anyone gets awkward, we drag him off to the solitary. There we break all his ribs and leave him until he's a goner. That's all right. Like we did with that butcher, eh, Repa? Yes, he gave us a lot of trouble, sir, replied Sergeant Major Repa dreamily. What a body. I stamped on him for more than five minutes until his ribs began to crack and blood poured out of his mouth. And he lived for another 10 days, a really tough customer. So you see, you bastard, what happens here when anyone starts getting awkward or trying to escape, said Staff Warder Slavik, concluding his pedagogical discourse. It's sheer suicide, and by the way, Suicide is punished too, and could help you, you miserable shit, if when there is an inspection, you take it into your head to complain about anything. When there is an inspection and you are asked, have you any complaints? You have to stand at attention, you stinking vermin, salute and answer. Humbly report, none. I'm completely satisfied. Now, what are you going to say, you lousy oaf? Repeat what I said. Humbly report, none. I'm completely satisfied. Schweik repeated with such a sweet expression on his face that the staff warder was misled and took it for honest zeal and decency. Now strip down to your pants and go to number 16, he said affably without adding either shit, stinking vermin, 
or lousy off as he usually did. In number 16, Schweik encountered 20 men in their pens. They were all men whose papers had been marked, guard and watch closely, and who were now being watched very carefully so that they should not escape. If those pens had been clean and there had been no bars on the windows, you might at first glance have supposed that you were in the dressing room of some bathing establishment. Sergeant Major Repa handed Schweik over to the cell commander, a hairy fellow in an unbuttoned shirt. He wrote, to Schwe he wrote Schweik's name down on a piece of paper which was hanging on the wall and said to him, tomorrow we are going to have a show. They'll take us to the chapel to hear a sermon. We shall all of us be standing in our pens right under the pulpit. There will be some fun. As in all prisons and penitentiaries, the local chapel was very popular in the garrison jail too. Not that, it, that enforced attendance at it brought the congregation near to God or that the prisoners learned more about morality. There could be no question of any nonsense of that kind. The service and sermons were a marvelous thrill in the boredom of the garrison jail. It was not a question of getting near to God, but of the hope of finding on the way in the corridor or in the courtyard a fag end or a cigar end. A little fag end lying about hopelessly in a spittoon or somewhere in the dust on the floor stole the show and God was nowhere. That little stinking object triumphed over God and the salvation of the soul. And the next readers will be Craig and Rebecca Cravens in Bloomington, Indiana. Then on top of that came the sermon, which was a rare picnic for the chaplain, Otto Katz, was really a lovely man. His sermons were unusually exciting and amusing, and they refreshed the boredom of the garrison jail. He could drivel so beautifully about the infinite grace of God and give uplift to the abandoned prisoners and disgraced men. He could let off such resounding oaths from the pulpit and the altar. He could roar out his ita missa est so gorgeously at the altar, conduct the whole service in such an original way and turn the whole order of the Holy Mass upside down. When he was thoroughly drunk, he could invent entirely new prayers and a new Holy Mass, even a liturgy of his own, something which was quite unheard of here. And then what a scream when he sometimes slipped and fell over with the chalice, the holy sacrament or the missile, loudly accusing the server from the prison unit of having purposely tripped him up and dealing him out solitary confinement or irons before the holy communion itself. And the recipient was happy because it was an inseparable part of the whole pantomime in the prison chapel. He played a leading part in the piece and acquitted himself honorably in it. The chaplain Otto Katz, the most perfect of army chaplains, was a Jew. By the way, there's nothing odd about that. Archbishop Cohn was a Jew too, and a friend of Machar into the bargain. Chaplain Otto Katz had an even more colorful past than the famous Archbishop Cohn. He studied at the Commercial Academy and served in the forces as a one-year volunteer. He mastered so thoroughly bills of exchange and the laws about them that within a year, he brought the firm of Katz & Co. Limited to such a glorious and successful bankruptcy that old Mr. Katz went off to North America pulling off a kind of settlement unbeknown to his creditors or his partner who went off to the Argentine. And so after having disinterestedly bestowed the firm of Katz and Co upon North and South America, young Otto Katz found himself in the position of a man who had no hopes of inheriting anything, had nowhere to lay his head and must therefore join the army. Before this, however, Otto Katz had hit upon an awfully fine idea. He had himself baptized. He turned to Christ to help him make a career. He applied to him in absolute confidence that this was a business transaction between him and the son of God. He was solemnly baptized in the Emmaus Monastery in Prague. Father Alban himself dipped him in the font. It was a magnificent spectacle. It was attended by a pious major from the regiment where Adokat served, an old maid from the Institute of Gentlewomen on the Hradchani, and a large jowled representative of the consistory who acted as his godfather. The officer's examination went off well, and the newly fledged Christian Otto Katz stayed in the army. At first, he thought he was going to do well and even wanted to study on staff courses. But one day, he got drunk and went into a monastery, gave up the sword, and donned the cassock. He was received by the archbishop on the Hradchani, 
and managed to get himself into the seminary. Before his ordination, he got drunk as a fish in a very respectable house served by ladies in the alley behind Uwe Vodou, and straight from a whirl of voluptuous pleasures and delights, went to have himself ordained. After his ordination, he went to his regiment to try and get them to help him get a job. After he was appointed chaplain, he bought a horse, rode through the streets of Prague, and took a merry part in all the drinking bouts with the officers of his regiment. In the corridor of the house where he lived, the curses of dissatisfied creditors could very often be heard. He also brought home tarts from off the streets or sent his orderly to fetch them. He loved playing Fierbo, and there were certain conjectures and presumptions that he cheated, but nobody caught him out with an ace hidden in the wide sleeves of his chaplain's cassock. In officer circles, they called him Holy Father. He never prepared his sermons beforehand, and in this he differed from his predecessor, who also used to visit the garrison jail. The latter was possessed by the fixed idea that men in the garrison jail could be reformed from the pulpit. This venerable chaplain piously rolled his eyes, explaining to the prisoners that prostitutes should be reformed and care for unmarried mothers improved and held forth about the bringing up of illegitimate children. His sermons were of an abstract character with no connection whatsoever with life today. They were very boring. Chaplain Otto Katz, on the contrary, delivered sermons which everybody looked forward to. It was a festive moment when they led the number 16s to the chapel in their pants, because to allow them to be dressed entailed the risk that one of them might escape. They put these 20 angels in white pants right under the pulpit. Some of them, upon whom fortune had smiled, were chewing fag ends which they had found on the way, because, as was only natural, they had no pockets and there was nowhere to put them. Around them stood the rest of the garrison prisoners and gazed with relish at the 20 men in pants beneath the pulpit. The chaplain climbed up into it, clinking his spurs. And here I turn it over to the venerable Otto Katz. Attention, he shouted. Let us pray forward after me, repeating what I say. And you at the back there, you bastard, don't snot into your hands. You're in the temple of the Lord and I'll have you locked up for it. I wonder if you haven't forgotten the Lord's prayer, you oafs. All right, let's try it. Well, I knew it wouldn't go. What the hell does a Lord's prayer mean to you? All you care about is two helpings of meat and bean salad, stuffing yourself up, lying on your backsides on your bunk and picking your nose without a thought for the Lord. Isn't that right? He stared down from the pulpit at the 20 white angels in pants who were thoroughly enjoying themselves like all the rest. At the back, they were playing flesh. This is first class, Schweik whispered to his neighbor, who was suspected of having taken an ax and chopped off all his mate's fingers to get him out of military service at the price of three crowns. You wait, was the answer. Today he's properly oiled again. He'll tell us once more about the thorny path of sin. True enough, the chaplain was in an excellent mood that day. He did not know himself why he was doing it, but he continually leaned out of the pulpit and nearly overbalanced. Sing something, boys, he shouted down to them. Or do you want me to teach you a new song? Now, sing with me. Of all the people in the world, I love my love the best. Yeah, I'm not her only visitor. I queue up with the rest. Her lovers are innumerable. Now tell me, pray, her name. It is the Virgin Mary. Yeah, you'll never learn it, you bastards, continued the chaplain. I'd like to have you all shot, do you understand? I state this from this holy place of God, you scoundrels, because God's a thing that's not afraid of you and will give you hell, and all because you hesitate to turn to Christ and you'd rather go along the thorny path of sin. Now it's coming, he's properly oiled, whispered Schweik's neighbor delightedly. The thorny path of sin, you bloody half-wits, is the path of the battle against vice. You are the prodigal sons who prefer to loll about in quad rather than return to the bosom of our father. But lift up your eyes to heaven on high and you will be victorious and peace will abide in your souls, you gutter snipes. I'd be glad if the person at the back would stop snorting. He's not a horse and he's not in a stable. He's in the temple of the Lord. Let me tell you that, ducks. Now then, where was I? Yes, he continued in German, about peace in your souls. Very good. Bear in mind, you cattle, that you're human beings, and that you must look through the dark clouds into the wide spaces and know that everything here lasts only for a moment, 
while God is for eternity. Very good, wasn't it, gentlemen? He lapsed into German again. I ought to pray for you day and night that merciful God, you bloody imbeciles, may infuse your cold hearts with his spirit and wash away your sins with his holy mercy, that you may be his forevermore and that he may love you forever, you blaggards. But that's just where you're wrong. I'm not going to lead you into paradise, the chaplain hiccuped. No, I won't, he repeated obstinately. I won't do anything for you. I wouldn't dream of it because you are incorrigible scum. On your ways, you will not be guided by the grace of the Lord. The breath of God's love will not be wafted onto you because the Lord would not dream of having anything to do with such twisters as you. Do you hear that? You down there below in the pants? 20 pairs of pants looked up and said, as with one voice, humbly report, sir, we hear. It's not enough just to hear, the chaplain continued. Dark is the cloud of life, and God's smile will not take away your woe, you bloody apes, for God's goodness has its bounds, too. And don't choke yourself, you bounder at the back there, or, or I'll have you locked up until you're black in the face. And you down there, don't think you're in the tap room? God is supremely merciful, but only to decent people and not to the scum of human society who won't be guided by his laws or by service regulations. That's what I wanted to tell you. You don't know how to pray, and you think that going to chapel is some kind of entertainment like being at, at a theater or the cinema. But I'll knock that out of your heads so that you don't think that I'm here to amuse you and bring pleasure to your lives. I'll send each one of you into solitary confinement. That's what I'll do, you sods. I'm wasting my time on you, and I see it's all quite useless. If the field marshal himself or the archbishop had been here, you wouldn't reform. You wouldn't incline to the Lord. But all the same, one of these days, you'll remember how I was trying to do you some good. Among the 20 pants, a sob could be heard. It was Schweik who had burst into tears. The chaplain looked down. There stood Schweik, rubbing his eyes with his fist. Round him, there were signs of gleeful appreciation. Pointing to Schweik, the chaplain continued, let every one of you take an example from this man. What is he doing? He's crying. Don't cry, I tell you, don't cry. Do you want to reform? That's not so easy for you, my lad. You're crying now, but when you go back to your cell, you'll be just as big a bastard as you were before. You'll have to think a lot about the unending grace and mercy of God. You'll have to work hard to see that your sinful soul finds the right path to tread in this world. Just now we saw a man who wants to be reformed bursting into tears. And what do the rest of you do? Nothing at all. Over there, someone's chewing something as though his parents had been ruminants. And over there, they're searching for lice in their shirts in the temple of the Lord. Can't you do your scratching at home? Must you reserve it just for the divine service? And staff warder, you never notice anything either. After all, you're all soldiers and not a lot of half-witted civilians. You've got to behave as befits soldiers, even if you're in a church. For Christ's sake, get on with searching for God and do your searching for lice at home. That's all I've got to say, you gutter snipes. And I request you to behave yourselves at mass so that it doesn't happen as it did last time when people in the back rows were bartering government linen for bread and then gorging it during the elevation of the host. The chaplain came down from the pulpit and went off to the vestry followed by the staff warder. After a while, the staff warder came out, went straight up to Schweik, pulled him out of the group of 20 pants and led him away to the vestry. The chaplain was sitting very comfortably on a table, rolling a cigarette. When Schweik came in, the chaplain said, oh, here you are. I've been thinking it all over and I believe I've seen through you. Do you understand, you bastard? It's the first case I've had of anyone blubbing in church here. He jumped down from the table and standing beneath a huge gloomy painting of St. Francis of Sales, jerked at Schweik's shoulder and shouted, confess that you blubbed for fun, you sod. And St. Francis of Sales gazed inquiringly down from his portrait at Schweik. From another painting on the other side, a martyr gazed open-mouthed at him while Roman mercenaries were sawing through his buttocks. During this operation, no suffering could be detected on the martyr's face, nor the joy, nor the glory of martyrdom either. He only stared open-mouthed as though he wanted to say, 
How on earth did this happen to me? What on earth are you doing to me, gentlemen? Humbly report, sir, said Schweig deliberately, staking everything on a single card. I confess to God Almighty and to you, venerable father, who are God's deputy, that I was really only blubbing for fun. I saw that for your preaching, you needed a reformed sinner and that you were look, looking for him in vain in your sermon. And so I really wanted to give you pleasure so that you shouldn't think that there weren't any just men left. And at the same time, I wanted to have a little fun on my own to get some relief. The chaplain looked searchingly at Schweig's artless countenance. A sunbeam played on the melancholy face of St. Francis of Solace and warmed the staring eyes of the martyr on the opposite wall. I'm beginning to take a fancy to you, said the chaplain, sitting on the table again. Which regiment do you belong to? He began to hiccup. Humbly report, sir. I belong and don't belong to the 91st Regiment, and I haven't the faintest idea how I really stand. And what are you in jail here for? Inquired the chaplain, continuing to hiccup. From the chapel, there wafted in this direction the sounds of a harmonium, which was a substitute for an organ. The musician, a teacher who had been jailed for desertion, wailed out on the harmonium the most mournful hymn tunes. With the hiccuping of the chaplain, these sounds blended to form a new Doric scale. Humbly report, sir. I don't know why I'm in jail here, but I don't complain. It's just my bad luck. My intentions are always the best, and in the end, I always get the worst of it, just like that martyr there in the picture. The chaplain looked at the picture and smiled and said, yes, I've really taken to you. I must ask the judge advocate about you, and I won't stay talking to you any longer. I must get that holy mass off my chest. About turn, dismiss. When Schweik returned to his family group of, of pants beneath the pulpit, he replied very dryly and laconically to their questions about what the chaplain had wanted of him in the vestry. He's sozzled. The chaplain's new performance, the Holy Mass, was followed by all with close attention and unconcealed enjoyment. One man under the pulpit even bet the monstrance would fall out of the chaplain's hands. He wagered his whole portion of bread against two across the jaw and won the bet. What inspired the souls of everyone in the chapel at the site of the chaplain's ministration was not the mysticism of the faithful or the piety of true Catholics. It was the feeling we have in the theater when we do not know what the play is about, when the plot develops and we breathlessly wait to see how it's going to end. They were absorbed in the scene which the chaplain with great devotion presented to them before the altar. They surrendered completely to the aesthetic enjoyment of the vestments which the chaplain had put on inside out and watched all the happenings at the altar with ardent sympathy and enthusiasm. The red-haired server, a deserter from the ranks of the sextons, a specialist in petty larcenies in the 28th regiment, was doing his level best to conjure up in his memory the whole ritual, technique, and text of the Holy Mass. He was both server and prompter to the chaplain, who quite frivolously turned whole sentences upside down and instead of getting to the ordinary mass, found himself at that point of the prayer book where the Advent Mass, mass came and then began to sing this to the general satisfaction of the congregation. He had neither voice nor musical ear, and under the vaulting of the chapel there resounded such a squealing and caterwauling as could only be heard in a pigsty. He's really well sozzled today, those sitting in front of the altar said with great joy and relish. He isn't half oiled, he's been at it again. He must have gotten tight with some tarts somewhere. And now for about the third time, the strains of Ite Misa Est rang out from the altar like a red Indian war whoop until the windows rattled. Then the chaplain looked once more into the chalice in case there should still be a drop left of wine in it, made a gesture of annoyance and addressed his listeners. Well, now you can go home, you bastards. It's all over. I observed that you don't show that true piety you ought to have when you are in church in the presence of the Holy of Holies, you cads. When you're face to face with God Almighty, you're not ashamed to laugh aloud, cough and snigger, shuffle your feet, even in my presence, who represent here the Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ, and God the Father, you bloody imbeciles. If you do this again next time, you'll get the hell you deserve, and you'll learn that there's not only that hell which I preached to you about in my last sermon, but one, 
but a hell on earth as well. And if you should by any chance save yourself from the first one, I'll see you don't escape from the second. Dismiss. And now we will go to Dustin Stalnecker, a historian in Rochester, New York. The chaplain who had just given such a wonderful practical demonstration of that damnable old custom, prison visiting, went into the vestry, changed his clothes, poured out some sacramental wine from, a, from the cask into a flagon, drank it up, and with the help of the red-haired server, mounted his horse, which was tied up to the courtyard, tied up in the courtyard. Then he remembered Schweik, dismounted again, and went to the office of Judge Advocate Bernice. Judge Advocate Bernice was a man who liked society. He was an elegant dancer and a rake who was frightfully bored here and spent his time writing German verses for girls' autograph albums so as to have a supply always at hand. He was the most important element in the whole apparatus of military justice. And because he had such a tremendous pile of unfinished cases and muddled documents, he was held in respect by the whole military court on Hradchani. He kept losing the documents for the indictment and was compelled to invent new ones. He mixed up names, lost the threads of the indictments and spun new ones just as they happened to come into his head. He tried deserters for theft and thieves for desertion. He brought in political cases which he had fabricated himself. He invented all kinds of hocus pocus to convict men of crimes that they had never even dreamt of. He invented insults to the monarch and always attributed fabricated incriminating statements to anyone if the indictment and informer's reports had gone lost in the unending chaos of documents and official correspondence. Hello, said the chaplain, shaking his hand. How are you? Not very well, answered Bernice. They've mucked up my papers and I can't make bloody head or tail of them. Yesterday, I put up the material I'd processed on a fellow had up for mutiny, and they sent it back, saying that in this case, it wasn't a question of mutiny, but rather stealing a tin. And I'd taken the trouble to give it a completely different number, and it beats me how they managed to discover it. The judge advocate spat. Are you still playing cards? Asked the chaplain. I've lost everything I had at cards. The last time it happened, I was playing Macau with that bald-headed colonel and I had to throw everything I'd got down his bloody maw. But I know of a nice young bird. And what are you doing, Holy Father? I need a Batman, said the chaplain. Last time I had an old bookkeeper without academic education, but a prize bastard. He kept on sniveling and praying that God would save him. And so in the end, I drafted him off to the front with a march battalion. They say it was cut to pieces. Then they sent me a little chap who did nothing but sit at the pub and drink at my expense. He was quite a tolerable cove, but had sweaty feet. So I drafted him off too. Today, when I was preaching, I found a bastard who, was, who started blubbing just for fun. That's the kind of cove I need. He's called Schweik and sits in number 16. I'd like to know why they've put him there and whether it wouldn't be possible somehow to arrange for me to get him out. The judge advocate started looking in the drawers for the files on Schweik, but as usual, he couldn't find anything. Captain Linhart will have them, he said after a long search. God knows where all these files of mine get to. I must have sent them to Linhart. I'll telephone to him at once. Hello, it's Lieutenant Bernice speaking, sir. Please, have you any chance some files about a man called Schweik. They must be with me. I'm surprised. I took them over to you. Well, I'm surprised. He's at present in number 16. I know, sir, that I've got the number 16 file with me, but I thought Schweik's papers must be lying around somewhere in your tray. You'd be glad if I didn't speak to you in that tone. Papers don't lie around in your tray. Hello, hello. Bernice sat down at the table and angrily condemned the disorderly way the investigations were being carried out. There was a long-standing feud between him and Captain Linhart, in which they were both very consistent. If Bernice got hold of papers belonging to Linhart, 
He arranged them in a way that no one could ever make head or tail of them. Linhart did exactly the same with papers belonging to Bernice. And of course, they lost each other's enclosures. The papers on Schweik were not found until after the war. They were in the archives of the Army Legal Department and were minuted, planned to throw off his hypocritical mask and come out publicly against our ruler and our state. The papers had been stuck into files dealing with a certain Joseph Gudella. On the file cover was a cross and underneath it, action completed with the date. So I've lost Schweik, said Bernice. I'll have him sent for, and if he doesn't confess to anything, I'll let him go and have him drafted to you, and you can settle it with his regiment. After the chaplain had gone, Bernice had Schweik brought before him, but left him standing at the door, because he had just received a telephone message from police headquarters that the material which was required for prosecution document number 7267 about infantryman, infantryman Mixner had arrived in office number one and been signed for by Captain Linhart. And with that, I pass the baton to Krista Pospisil in Illinois. Meanwhile, Schweik inspected the judge advocate's office. One could not say that it made a very favorable impression, especially the photographs on the walls. They were photographs of various executions carried out by the army in Galicia and Serbia. They were artistic photographs of charred cottages and trees with branches sagging under the weight of bodies strung up on them. Particularly fine was a photograph from Serbia of a whole family strung up, a small boy and his father and mother. Two soldiers with bayonets were guarding the tree and an officer stood victoriously in the foreground smoking a cigarette. On the other side, in the background, a field kitchen could be seen in full operation. Well, what's the trouble with you, Schweik? asked Bernice when he had filed away the telephone message. What have you been up to? Are you going to confess or wait until a charge is brought against you? It can't go on like this. Don't imagine that you're before a court where you'll be tried like lunatic civilians. Ours are courts martial, the Imperial and Royal Military Court. The only way you can save yourself from a severe and just punishment is to confess. Bernice had a special method when he had lost the material against the accused. As you can see, there was nothing special about it, and so we need not be surprised if the results of such an examination and cross-questioning always amounted to Nick's. And Bernice felt he was always so clairvoyant that without having any material against the accused, and without knowing what he was accused of or why he was imprisoned in the garrison jail, but simply by observing the behavior and physiognomy of the man who had been brought before him for interrogation, he could deduce why they had imprisoned him. His clairvoyance and knowledge of human nature was so great that a gypsy who was sent by his regiment to the garrison jail for stealing a few dozen shirts, he was helping the storekeeper in a store, was accused by him of political crimes. Allegedly, he had spoken in a pub somewhere with some soldiers about the setting up of an independent national state made up of the lands of the Bohemian crown and Slovakia and ruled by a Slav king. We have material evidence, he said to the unfortunate gypsy. There's nothing left for you but to confess in which pub you said it, which regiment those soldiers came from, who listened to you and when it took place. The unfortunate gypsy invented not only the date, but the pub and the regiment which his alleged listeners came from. And when he left the interrogation, he ran away from the garrison altogether. So you won't confess to anything, said Bernice, when Schweik remained deathly silent. You won't say why you're here and why you're put in jail. You could at least have told me before I tell it myself. I warn you once more that you'd better confess. It will be easier for you because it helps the investigation and alleviates the punishment. In that respect, it's just the same here as in a civil court. Humbly report, sir, Schweik piped up good-naturedly. I am here in garrison jail because I'm a foundling. What do you mean by that? Humbly report, sir. I can explain it quite simply. 
in our street, there's a coal merchant and he had an entirely innocent two-year-old little boy. This laddie once walked all the way from Vinohrady to Lieben, where a policeman found him sitting on the pavement. So he took him to the police station and locked him up there, a two-year-old child. The little boy was, as you see, quite innocent, and yet he was locked up. And if he'd been able to speak and anyone had asked him why he was locked up, he wouldn't have known either. And it's rather like that with me. I'm a foundling too. The keen gaze of the judge advocate passed swiftly over Sheikh's figure and face and foundered on them. Such unconcern and innocence radiated from the whole of the being which stood before him that Bernice began to pace nervously up and down his office. And if he had not given his word to the chaplain, God knows what might have happened to Sheikh. Finally, he came to a standstill again by his table. Listen, he said to Shveik, who was gazing unconcernedly in front of him. If I ever meet you again, you'll never forget it. Take him away. When they took Shveik back to number 16, Bernice had Staff Order Slavi called before him. Until further orders, he said laconically, Shveik is sent to Chaplain Katz for his disposal. Prepare his discharge papers and have him escorted to the chaplain by two men. Is he to be put in handcuffs for the journey, sir? The judge advocate banged his fist on the table. You're an elf. I told you quite distinctly to make his discharge papers out. And all the bile which had accumulated in the judge advocate's soul in the course of that day because of Captain Linhart and Schweik poured out like a wild torrent on the head of the staff warder. At the end of it, Bernice said, and now do you understand that you are a prize royal oaf? This is something which should only be said to kings and emperors. But even if this simple staff warder, who was no royal personage, was not very pleased about it. On his way back from the judge advocate's office, he gave a cruel kicking to a prisoner on fatigue duty who was cleaning the corridor. As for Shveik, the staff warder made up his mind that he must spend at least one night more in the garrison jail so as to derive a little more benefit from it. And now I turn it over to Abigail Weil in Philadelphia. Thank you. The nights spent in the garrison jail will always rank among Shafiq's most affectionate memories. Next to number 16 was the black hole, a murky pit for solitary confinement from which could be heard during the night the howls of a soldier whose ribs were being broken by Sergeant Major Zepa at the orders of Staff Order Slavik because of a disciplinary offense. When the howling stopped, there could be heard in number 16, the smashing of lights, which got in between the fingers of the prisoners during their search. Above the doors in an aperture in the wall, a paraffin lamp fitted with the protective grill emitted a feeble light and smoked. The smell of paraffin mingled with the natural exhalations of unwashed human bodies and the stench of the bucket, which every time it was used had its surface stirred up and added a new wave of stink to number 16. The bad food made the digestive process difficult for everyone, and the majority suffered from wind, which they released into the stillness of the night, answering each other with these signals to the accompaniment of various witticisms. In the corridors could be heard the measured tread of the sentries. From time to time, the aperture in the door opened and a warder peered through the people. From the middle bunk could be heard a voice quietly saying, before I tried to escape, and before they brought me here among you, I was in number 12. There they keep the light cases. Once they brought in a chap from somewhere in the country. The good fellow had got 14 days because he allowed soldiers to stay overnight with him. At first they thought it was a plot, but then it turned out he did it for the money. He should have been locked up among the lightest cases, but because it was full there, he came to us. And you can't imagine all the things he brought with him from home and what they sent him because he somehow got permission to order his own food and make things cozy for himself. And he got permission to smoke. He had two hams, giant loaves of bread, eggs, butter, cigarettes. Well, in short, everything um, he had in his knapsacks, everything you could dream of. And the bastard thought he must guzzle it all up himself. 
we started begging him to share with us when he didn't hit on the idea himself like others did when they got something, but he was a mean bastard and said no. He'd be locked up for 14 days and the cabbage and rotten potatoes which they gave us for mess rations would ruin his stomach. He said he'd give us all his mess rations and army bread, but it wasn't worth having and we could share it among ourselves or have it in turns. I tell you, he was such a gent that he didn't even want to sit in the bucket and waited until the next day for the exercise hour so he could do it out in the latrine in the courtyard. He was so spoiled, he even brought his own toilet paper. We told him we didn't care a damn about his rations and we braved it out one, two, three days. The bastard guzzled ham, spread butter on his bread, shelled his eggs. In short, he lived like a pig in clover. He smoked cigarettes and wouldn't give anyone even a puff. He said that we weren't allowed to smoke. And if the warder were to see him giving us a puff, they'd lock him up. As I said, we stood it for three days. But on the fourth day, in the night, we did it. The bastard woke up early, and I forgot to tell you, in the early morning at noon and in the evening before he began to stuff himself, he always prayed and prayed for a very long time. And so this time he prayed and then looked for his knapsacks under his bunk. Yes, the knapsacks were there, but they were dried up and shrunk like dried prunes. He began to shriek that he'd been robbed and that we'd only left him his toilet paper. And then for about five minutes, he thought we were only joking and we had hidden it somewhere. He was, uh, he said still quite merrily, I know you're only teasing. I know you'll give it back to me, but it was neatly done. There was a chap among us from Leven. Uh, and he said, look, cover yourself with your blanket and count up till 10 and then look in your knapsacks. And he covered himself and counted. One, two, three, like an obedient little boy. And then the chap from Lee Ben said again, you mustn't do it so quickly. You must do it very slowly. And there he was under the blanket, counting slowly at intervals. One, two, three. And when he got to 10, he climbed out of the bunk and looked into his knapsacks. Jesus, Mary, chaps, he began hollering. They're just as empty as they were before. And all the time, his face was so bloody silly that we could have all split our sides with laughter. And then that chap from Lee Ben went on, try once more. And believe me, he was so crazy after all this that he tried again. And when he saw there was still nothing there except his toilet paper again, uh, and he began to bang on the door and to shout out, they've robbed me, they've robbed me, help, open, for Christ's sakes, open. And then they all came rushing in and called the staff order and Sergeant Major Jeppa. And we all said with one voice that he had gone mad that the day before he had gorged far into the night and guzzled everything up. But he just wept and kept on saying, surely there must be some crumbs left. And then they started looking for crumbs and couldn't find any because we were quite clever too. What we had not been able to guzzle ourselves, we sent up by rope post to the second story. They couldn't prove anything on us, although some stupid that stupid fool kept on with his, but surely there must be some crumbs left. The whole day he ate nothing and looked carefully to see whether anyone ate or smoked anything. And at lunch the next day, he didn't touch his rations. But in the evening, the rotten potatoes and cabbage seemed to appeal to him. Only he didn't pray as much as he used to when he would tuck into his ham and eggs. Then one of us somehow got some fags from outside. And then he began talking to us for the first time, asking us to give him a puff. But we didn't give him anything. I was afraid you'd give him a puff, said Shvake. That would have spoiled the whole story. You only find such noble actions like that in novels, but in the garrison jail, in such circumstances, it would be sheer lunacy. And you didn't give him the blanket treatment, someone asked. We didn't think of it. Then a discussion began in hushed tones as to whether he should have got the blanket treatment or not. The majority were for it. The conversation gradually died out. They were falling asleep, scratching themselves under their armpits, on their chests, on their bellies, at those points in their underclothes where the lice congregated most. They went to sleep 
drawing the lace-ridden blankets over their heads so that the light of the paraffin lamp shouldn't disturb them. At eight o'clock in the morning, they called Shveik to go to the office. On the left-hand side of the door leading into the office, there's a spittoon and they throw fag ends in it, one man informed Shveik. On the first floor, you'll pass another one. They don't sweep the passages till nine o'clock, so something may still be there. But Shveik disappointed their hopes. He never came back to number 16. The 19 pairs of pants made various deductions and conjectures about him. A freckled soldier belonging to the Lanvair, who had very lurid imagination, spread the news that Schweik had shot his captain and would be led away the same day to the drill ground at Motol for execution. Thank you, Abigail, and thanks so much to that whole crew for uh, uh, those great readings just now. Za císa řepana a jeho rodinu. Za císa řepana a jeho rodinu. 